welcome to our review on the solar system. So hopefully one thing that we do all know is that Earth is part of the solar system. So within our solar system we've got the Sun, which is the central point, and then we've got a variety of planets that then orbit around it. And the reason they orbit around the Sun is because the Sun has this strong force of gravity that keeps them all in their lines. Now you do need to remember the order of the planets. Okay, so make sure that you've got some kind of little rhyme that's going to help you to remember the order of the planets working out from the sun. So one example I've got there for you, my very excellent mother just served us nachos. Feel free to come up with anything at all that will stick in your mind. Just something that's going to help you to remember that correct order. And remember Pluto these days isn't actually a planet, so we don't have to remember that one in that order. Now, if we've got a force that's making an object move in a circular path, that's something referred to as a centripetal force. Now, it's this centripetal force that's going to keep the planets in their orbits, and what we find is that that centripetal force is caused by the gravitational attractions between the Sun and the other planets. So remember, any large body has the force of gravity, so that what we find is the Sun is huge, it's amazingly big in reality. So that's obviously got a very strong pull of gravity, and each of the planets within our solar system also has its own pull of gravity. So all of those gravitational attractions are going to be keeping those planets in their little orbits, just all moving at that exact same point around our solar system. When we're thinking about our whole universe, then we're talking about more than just our solar system here. So we really should remember what the universe contains, and this should be in order from the smallest to the largest. So the smallest objects in our universe would be meteors, then we've got our comets, then come the black holes, then we get planets, stars, and finally galaxies. Now, we actually live in a galaxy called the Milky Way, and the Milky Way itself is made up of 200 billion stars. And our sun is one of those 200 billion stars. So it gives you some idea of the magnitude of this thing we call the universe. It's huge. In fact, it's very hard to comprehend how big it is. And if we then amplify it up into what the whole universe contains, then there are 50 billion galaxies. So our little sun, with its little planets around it that we're part of, that's one of 200 billion stars in the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is one of 50 billion galaxies in the universe, potentially each of them having 200 billion stars each. So it does hopefully give you some idea of the sheer magnitude of this thing we call the universe. As humans, one of the things we like to do is explore places we haven't been. And the universe is one of those places that is this big unknown, I suppose. Now, we've got two options on how we can actually explore the universe. We can use either manned or unmanned crafts, and each of them has their own advantages and disadvantages. So unmanned craft are obviously ones that don't have humans on them. So we can send up probes and things like this up into space and send them off traveling through the universe. And as they go, they collect data on temperatures, magnetic field strengths, atmospheres, strength of gravities, lots of information there. That information is then transmitted back to Earth, where we can then obviously look at it and work out what that means about the different planets, the different moons, the different stars, etc. In terms of their maintenance, it actually requires a lot less than a manned craft, because we don't have to worry about any of these conditions that would kill a human. We don't need to worry about the fact that it has to be at a certain temperature, it has to have oxygen present and all of these things that humans are really inconveniently needing. So what we find is we need less maintenance because there's fewer systems involved in it, and it will also withstand conditions that will be lethal to us as humans. If, however, we consider the manned craft, then because we're going to put humans on this thing, then we need to obviously feed them, give them water, and let them breathe mainly. So we're going to need large amounts of food, oxygen, and water, and that's got to be enough to sustain them for however long their mission is. As a result of that increased mass, then we're going to need extra fuel in order to actually get it out of our atmosphere and then carry out its journey. And we need to consider how to protect these humans we're sending up into space. 
because we've got cosmic rays that we've got to shield them from we need to obviously think about how we're going to reduce their muscle wastage in that low gravity environment so finding gym equipment that they can actually use without just floating off into nowhere we obviously need to make sure the temperature is right and then the atmosphere is controlled if you've seen Apollo 13 you obviously know the dangers of that not being controlled there and finally it's always nice to bring them back we don't generally like to send astronauts off into space and then not get them back obviously this is a dangerous game to actually get involved in space travel has not been free of its own disasters and at the bottom there I've just given you some clippings about three of those big disasters there so we have lost astronauts who have literally had their space shuttles actually explode etc whether it's on re-entry or even on takeoff so this is not something that is free from danger but if we have someone on a spacecraft then should something go wrong when it's out in space then there's a chance they could fix it whereas on an unmanned craft if something goes wrong then that's pretty much game over for that unmanned craft 